Welcome to another episode of our personal empowerment audio series, Finding Yourself in Paradise. Hi, I'm Michael Benner. And I'm Steve Snyder. And our program today is about dreams. We're going to be talking about daydreams and night dreams, big dreams and little dreams, dreaming up your life and dreaming your life away, all kinds of dreams. I love this topic because I think it's one of the most fascinating experiences we can have in life and yet... We're so busy, we take it for granted, and few people ever even stop to consider the implications. What does this mean? What's going on? What, what, what is a dream? I mean, generically, it's a reference to something positive, a goal, or a, a result that we really, really want. But we're talking about the phenomena, first of all, of waking up in the morning and remembering some thoughts that you had when you were unconscious, like an hour ago or maybe two hours ago. But we're also going to talk about the phenomena of lucid dreaming and also what your daydreams have to do with all of this. So all kinds of dreams, the kinds we have at night, there are basically three different kinds of dreams at night. There's the falling asleep kind of dream at the beginning of the night. There's all kinds of different kinds of dreams in the middle of the night. And then there's a a REM state waking up in the morning kind of dream. And usually when people do remember the dreams, it's the one they were just having yeah, as they woke up. Just before up. they woke up. But yeah. we can occasionally remember dreams farther back in, into the night. And then there's the idea of dreams, you know, like goals and visions and, and wish fu- to be fulfilled, things, things we really want to create and accomplish and become in our lives. So dreams is an amazing thing. And when you think about almost everything that's going on in your mind, all the thoughts and all feelings put together is really dreaming, uh, with the exception perhaps of remembering things and really when you remember something you're not remembering a snapshot of it you're remembering the last time you remembered it so it really is part memory and part dream anyway most of what we're doing really is dreaming awake or asleep yeah dreaming is certainly um, imagination i think it's a complement to the will and to the reasoning tendency of the will that's what the objective self, the conscious willpower or free will wants to do, I think, is basically be logical and be deductive and take these big ideas and break them down into little bits. But the idea of using the imagination to dream, to daydream, you want to start with daydreams and then we'll cycle around to the night dreams and come back. How's that? Daydreams are definitely of the imagination and, as I say, kind of a compliment in that they tend to be overarching concepts are about the big picture, the concept, the uh, the gestalt, and often represents uh, a wholeness to life. That urge to get someplace or be somebody, I think in many ways dreams are an attempt to make us whole. Yeah, uh, we often talk about the Paul Simon line and the thought that life could be better is woven indelibly into our hearts and our brains. The idea of wanting more, of being able to envision more, that kind of dreaming is very, very powerful. And I think it's inherent in all of us to want to do that. But then there's the other side of that daydreaming concept where people look at daydreams as a waste of time, as a a way to fritter away their day, a way to avoid looking at what's real. I mean, there are people who think the only time you're really being serious about a problem is when you're thinking about the problem and you're not daydreaming about possible solutions. Right. So that kind of, like, don't daydream, don't waste your time with daydreaming, that, that concept is something to take a look at, too, because you can dream up your life or you can dream your life away. And, and of course, as Neil Young said, if you follow every dream, you might get lost. So we have to pick and choose our dreams. We can use dreaming to escape from life or we can use, and or we can use dreaming to create our future. Wow, that's really well said, because we do need to acknowledge that uh, there are those people that we know, and maybe even tendencies within us that we can identify to just be a dreamer. You know, it's like the flip side of worry. It seems when you worry like you're getting a lot done, but you're really not. And so it is with daydreaming. It, it, It can be a kind of nice, gentle, rainbows and unicorns way of spinning your wheels and really not getting any place. But for those who are goal-oriented, who want to, as Stephen Covey says, begin with the end in mind, to determine a direction even more than an outcome, and that's one of our key concepts in this whole series, daydreaming is the seminal first step toward creating that most detailed and accurate goal. And so what is it that causes people to not daydream about 
making dreams come true, about goals, about visions, about about wanting more to be better than they are. And I think I think that comes down to this programming we get in early childhood from our parents who tell us not to daydream, not to vision, not to get your hopes up too high, get your head out of the clouds, keep your feet on the ground because, you know, you might get disappointed. You know, this has always been one of my most passionate pleas is to say to parents... Some pet peeve of yours, I'd it, it really is. To, <laughs> that... that, that Disappointment is made out to be this horrible, terrible thing, and so life we, crushing event. Exactly. So we we fail to feel like we can dream because if we dream and we get our hopes up high, then we'll be disappointed. So it's saying, in essence, if you are afraid of disappointment, never shoot at the bullseye. Never aim at the target. You know, always aim at something much less than the target because otherwise, if you aim at the target, you're probably not going to hit the target every single time. So, therefore, you're going to be disappointed. This is an absurd notion. Get your sets, set your sights really, really high. Dream really, really big. There is no value in little dreams because the mind isn't motivated by them. The mind's not moved by small dreams. It's like the, the mind does not much care about the odds. It'll go for great, it won't do the impossible. It'll be great against great odds. It'll try things. But but the size of the prize is what motivates the mind, the possible how great the outcome could be. And remember, as we've always said, happiness comes from moving toward getting what you want, not from getting it. The point of having a giant dream is twofold, really. One is to give you the direction to take your next step, because you know if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there, as George Harrison said. And then to be big, giant enormous gargantuan so it motivates you it magnetizes you to take that first step which as your teacher once said is the hardest part of accomplishing anything she put it as i recall the hardest part about moving the refrigerator is getting it unstuck from the floor yeah something we can all relate to i'm sure so by setting logic aside long enough to have a nice lucid daydream we get two benefits from that. We get a clear, specific goal, a target, a bullseye. Not just a target, but a bullseye that we can use to determine a direction to begin to move. But we also get the emotional, emotion, energy in motion, the force behind that idea. Both of those, the energy and the force, the goal and the passion, the focus and the passion. There's our website name, Focused Passion are products of using the imagination. These wonderfully peaceful altered states of deep relaxation and safety where the emotional nature is calm enough to be passionate on a single thing. Sounds a little contradictory, but work with that idea. Calm enough that the passion can be focused on a particular outcome. And in the same way, the mind quiet enough that it too can focus on that particular goal. Now we're laser beamed and ready to go. And for those who think that, you know, logic is always the best way to accomplish things, it's just not really true. Dreaming is essential in some areas. For example, if you do know what you want, but you don't know how to get it, then you can often use logic to figure out a, a way to get what it is you want. But, you know, if you don't know what you want, Logic is useless. You can't figure out what you want because what you want is not logical. If what you wanted was logical, everyone would want the same thing. What you want is purely what you want. It's emotional and it's intuitive. And so you can't use logic. You have to dream to figure out what you want. So most people are afraid of dreaming, thinking that, a, it's a waste of time, or B, if I if I do dream something wonderful and I don't get it, I'll have this terrible disappointment thing. So they they discount their daydreams, they push away, they think it is an escape, and it can be an escape. Daydreaming can be an escape if there's no, it's like wishing. It's like there's really no thought at all of actually making it come true. It's just, you know, spacing out and daydreaming. But you can take that same state and put intention to create that coming true or moving toward that coming true. And you create one of the most powerful things the human mind can do. Something that no animal can do the way we can do, which is actually influence our future. I think another point that we have to bring up about the nature of daydreaming and the use of imagination is that it's a two-way street. That in these relaxed states where the mind is focused and it's easiest to daydream, not only do we communicate with the subconscious and with the brain more effectively, but we can also in the same way be more receptive to listening to communication from what we call the higher self which could be the innate intelligence of the brain 
with a consciousness of the subconscious mind, that part that's always working even though we're unconscious, as in sleep or a coma, there's obviously some part of the mind that's still making decisions on autopilot, managing breathing and pulse and, my goodness, blood pressure and body temperature and and hundreds and hundreds of other response systems in the body, automatically, autonomically. That's how we know there is a subconscious, because you don't die when you go to sleep. Something keeps regulating. Something's even listening for an alarm. So if you know there's people living with you in this house, in the middle of the night you're sleeping, they move around, you'll probably sleep through it. But if you live alone and you hear somebody in the house, boy, you're up like that in a flash. Especially if you have kids. Yes, <laughs> yes. My wife talks about the time I came home late and she did not wake up. And that's how she knew her kids were truly grown and gone. Yeah. Because she had let go of that instant. But think about it. What does that mean? It means some part of the brain and therefore some part of the mind that expresses through the brain is conscious and working, even though what we call the conscious self is unconscious. Now, that's a little confusing, but I think we got to sort that out and sort of celebrate how cool that is. Indeed, and not only is it, is it working, it can actually work in such a way to block out things to make sure it knows when those alarms. I mean, they used to do a thing called sleep teaching where you'd put a tape recorder on and play language tapes all night and you're supposed right. to live. But af- what we learned was after a very short time, the mind can actually block out that whole tape recorder noise to make sure that there's no danger noises out there. So it's working. There's a part that's going on. Check it out. Now, this no, nope, this paper recorded noise isn't dangerous. Let's well, block that out. Your partner is snoring, for there you example. Go. If you're in love, you will learn not to hear that. <laughs> or or how to gently nudge so that it stops for a moment. <laughs> I, you know, there are different ways of dealing with that issue. But, but you're right. We do learn to block out those noises that our brain knows are safe. So we can be aware of those noises that aren't. So there's always a part of us that's sort of got a little antenna up that's slightly awake. But when we dream during the day, when, when we dream away from our life to escape from life that's often not a purposeful dream it's often the stream of consciousness is going by the train of thought is going where it's going choo chewing by and you pick something out of that train of consciousness and just pick something out because it's got some passion connected to it and you just follow it along and you go where it takes you but the kind of daydreaming we're really talking about is where you stop to think like what do i want like what do i want the most what do I want to create? What do I want to have, do, or be? And I'm going to daydream purposely, intentionally. I'm going to purposely space into the idea of watching myself become. Yeah, I'm going to slide behind the driver's seat, and instead of being a victim of my imagination, I'll actually guide it and steer it along and make some gentle decisions. It's like you're flowing downstream, but you still put the oars in the water just to sort of... You know, keep yourself where you want to be, keep yourself oriented a little bit. Again, what a fascinating concept. You use the word purposefully, and it's not an unfamiliar word to people who listen to us. But where else in our lives do we hear people talking about the difference between applied thinking or purposeful thinking And stream of consciousness, where your mind just goes wherever it goes. This is not studied by most people. Most of our good friends and neighbors don't reflect upon this. It happens to be a curiosity for me since I was a little boy. It's been a curiosity for you since you were a little boy, for whatever reason. So we've pursued it. But it seems to me this... If nothing else, is a quality of critical thinking that we're going to have to begin to teach in schools. And I think the sooner the better, from from K, first grade on, what does it mean to be a critical thinker? Obviously, the curriculum for a grade schooler would not be the same as for a high school or college student. But what a perfect time to begin to help a child reflect upon their thoughts so they could escape the prison that so many of our neighbors live in, believing they are their thoughts, driven by their thoughts, victims of their own thinking. See, when you become a purposeful dreamer, 
then you realize you're the dreamer, not the dream. So you become aware of the fact that you are aware, that you are awareness. And that's the key. The younger that we can learn that and the more we can master that awareness, the more powerful we become, the more happy we live. You know, I mean, it's just happy as our birthright and we just get to live it, you know, once we're conscious. Because, it, you know, we talk about attachment being what causes pain. You know, it's like needing a certain outcome and not having it and being different than what I want to be. Resisting the is is the way I look at it. You know, like it, like what is right now isn't okay enough, you know, and that's what causes so much pain. Well, we can dream about better things, happier things, more wonderful lives without it being painful if we have a really high intention that that dream come true but a very, very low attachment to the dream coming true. Like I don't need that dream to come true. I I'm open to something better than that coming true. <laughs> and I'm also open to something that doesn't look quite as good as that on the surface, but I know it contains the lessons, the gifts, the the challenges I need to master so I can really appreciate it when I do get it. There may be a silver lining in there. Even if I don't get what I want, maybe I get something I need and then later find out that was pretty cool after Yeah, all. and maybe that's what I needed to have before I could get what I wanted. Yeah, that's so. something maturity brings us. But again, what if we could foreshadow that for young kids? and yeah. say it's likely in your life that these horrible disappointments actually turned out to be rose gardens for you. So don't be surprised if that happens. And and it's the truth. It's not like we're sugarcoating anything. No. That is the reality. Life is rigged. And to be miserable, you really have to work at it. And this, too, is difficult to talk about in metaphysics or mind science or personal development because all of us have, as conscious people, developing our awareness, an understanding of true victimization where there is extreme poverty and, and true oppression and the gross injustice involved in all of that. And I want to be sensitive to that, Steve. Every time, we always have been. Every time we talk about, you can do it. You can have the conviction of your dreams. And, and you can do anything you want to do. you got to remember, we're talking about most people in the Western world. But, you know, it reminds me of, like, in the mid-'80s, there was this world convention back when the G20 was the G6, I think, when they first started. And... Ronald Reagan was president, and this meeting was in Cancun, and President Reagan basically said to the third world, you've got to be entrepreneurs, go into business for yourself. And again, a nice idea, and it hit home with a lot of Americans with that can-do spirit, people that came to this country for that reason. But the absurdity of people who don't even have clean drinking water Right, who don't have the fuel to boil the water to prevent their kids from getting severe dehydration and dying, right? Who don't even have the, the two pennies a day for minimal nutrition. To talk to them about entrepreneurship is ridiculous. Yeah, it's the Marie Antoinette syndrome, you know, like, uh, but but they don't have any bread. Well, then let them eat cake. Yeah, cake you know? and English muffins <laughs> That's right. and yeah, croissants. Like, and... I'm sorry they're out for the moment, but, <laughs> you know, yeah, it, we do have to understand that. But But that being said... Those who come from severe poverty, those that come from suppression and oppression, some of them do rise to great successes. Still in their lives. can't wait for the cavalry to come. And, I mean, we have to That's help right. those people. And, and they rise because they dream and other people believe in their dreams and help them with their dreams and, and make their I dreams. I like that old aphorism about uh, when it comes to community service and, and being your brother's keeper. It's not giving him fish, it's teaching him to fish. And maybe, well, as you did, you bought a, a fishing net for a small <laughs> community on the east end of the island. Oh, you need a net? Well, we'll get you a net. You didn't buy him fish. I, I think that's what we're talking about. Nobody really wants charity. It doesn't feel good. But a helping hand to get on my feet so that I can learn to stand on my own, that's a very different thing. But those who are unwilling to dream never open their heart to that, receiving that kind of donation or help in their lives. You or know? giving it in or giving cases. It, you know. In either case. So what we're talking about is allowing yourself to have some time during your day where you take over and purposely 
create this state of mind, you know, the alpha brainwave state, the place of paradise, the place of perfect peace where you go there and intentionally, purposely dream about something that you want the most. I think that's a really important distinction because when you dream about what you want, there's so many directions you can go. There's so many things you want, you know, but what do you want the most? And what do you want the most in your relationship with your closest people? What do you want the most in your career and in your life? What do you want the most? That, that's something I think you can purposely dream about. And here's, here's the point, though. You can dream about how it could be a little bit better than it is, or you could dream about the best it could possibly be. And the fear that of dreaming of the best that it possibly could be is the likelihood it's not going to get there. I mean, if you can dream the best it could be, everything has to transpire perfectly for it to occur, it's likely that's not going to occur. But if you get rid of your fear of disappointment, if you hold lightly and not attach to that outcome, then it it makes sense to shoot at the bullseye. It just doesn't make any sense to aim small. Dehock said there's no failure in, in not realizing all that you dream. The failure is in not dreaming all that you can realize. So the idea is dream huge, get as far as you can get. Dream little, get there, but feel dissatisfied. So we're talking about the kind of dreaming that only you can do about you. The kind of dreaming that only you have the ability to do about what your life could become. Now, Steve, let's go from this to dreaming about dreaming. And what I mean by that is using the daydream just as you go to sleep to suggest that as you become unconscious and, quote, fall asleep, that those suggestions will take root and you begin to dream about the daydream. You've suggested or programmed or incubated a dream. Yeah, this used to be called dream incubation. They don't use that term much anymore, but but the idea is you're planting the seed and you're watering it and you're making sunlight fall on it and you're getting everything set up so that when you do drop off to sleep, that you'll, your daydream will almost basically continue into a night dream. And those, those first dreams that we have happen actually before we fall asleep. I mean, and actually, you know, we really sort of do fall asleep. Brainwaves go, ee! They drop real suddenly. Sometimes you feel a dropping sensation even. So before we we go from a daydream into that night dream, and then at the end of that night dream, that's where we drop off into a deeper sleep state. And, of course, we go about down, down, down for about 45 minutes, up, up, up for about 45 minutes, have some more dreams, and then down for 45, up for about a 90-minute cycle between. But we can actually incubate, as you say, that first dream or set of dreams we have at night by intentionally daydreaming about something and making ourselves do that. Now, you also, it's, it's a crapshoot. I mean, you, you can let it happen, whatever happens, and it's going to probably be for your best. But do understand, if your mind is in a worry mode, in an anxiety mode, in a tension kind of mode, then it's quite likely that that will carry into your dream, and you'll have a, a dream that is a tension. Now, that's good for you to get rid of tension and anxiety. It's something you need to do, but you you can create something better out of your dreams yeah, if you want to. Nightmare, you know? Nightmares. Yeah. You can create nightmares. They say, well, you must have eaten something. Or watch the 11 o'clock news. Yeah, too much news. That's a good idea. Why don't you give that tip? Yeah, you know, three tips, actually. Like, get some exercise during the day, uh, eat things that make sense and not like pepperoni pizza at midnight, and don't watch the 11 o'clock news. Don't, you don't let your kids watch horror movies before they go to sleep. You know, you know better than to do that. This is bad. News is almost all uh, stuff that get our churned up or get our anxiety and fear and feeling endangered levels up. So that's the last thing. If you need to watch the news, you know, first thing in the morning is a way better time than last thing at night. But what we want to do is put ourselves into a particular state of mind, a frame of mind, a mood, an attitude, a way of looking at things before we go to sleep so we can make best use of our dreams, so we can actually incubate a dream that could solve a problem or or heal our hearts. In other words, you're providing a vehicle, the nighttime dream, for creativity and intuition to express through you without the kind of conscious blocks that normally prevent us from receiving the message. You see, it's a... It's almost an end run around those conscious blocks. The it'll never work thoughts. The, you know, oh, I could never accomplish that thoughts. Yeah, that part of your brain, that logical, rational, I've never done this before, that goes to sleep. That's the part that goes to sleep. You take a look at the content of your dreams at night, anything can happen there. And so the idea of dreaming up amazing new things is so powerful. My life changed 
in an instant with one dream I had when I was 12 years old that completely changed my life. I mean, I was I was having these two great passions going on in my life, uh, self-hypnosis, the alpha state, and, and reading. I loved doing both. And I had this dream one night where I... I had the idea of putting them both together and creating a speed reading technique using Alpha. And, and my whole career opened up because of this dream that I had and I remembered in my night. And I was like really thinking about like, wow, I love doing this and I love doing that. And, and I went to sleep with that idea of I love doing both of these things. And they, they married in my dream and I created this amazing thing. Dreams, almost every great idea, any great invention, any great invention of every woman and every man in history began in a dream or a daydream. Yeah, Edison used to promote that with naps and the story we've told on occasion about holding the lead ball in his lap and if he did go too deep into his cat nap or his meditation, his visualization exercise, we'd call it guided imagery today, he'd drop the damn ball, wake himself up, and then go back for that balance spot between awake and asleep. Again, He's creating focused passion, right? He wants to calm that emotional passion so that he gets a focus on it. Clear in the mind, logic, clear in the heart, passion. You laser, Instead of a floodlight or a spotlight even, now you get it down to a laser beam, and that's how the mind works. Keep in mind, though, there are receptive states as well. You can program a dream to contain information that not only will allow you to experience in the dream how it feels to get the outcome, but to actually receive information to help you move toward that desired result. Right, and sometimes the dreams just allow you to get rid of the fears and the anxieties of your daily life. You see a car accident on the side of the road and you have a dream about being in a car accident, it's because you have built up more fear of the car accident than you needed and you're using the dream to release some of that fear. It's a it's a emotional release kind of dream. So there's all kinds of good reasons to have bad dreams. I mean, bad dreams are good just like bad thoughts are good because if we use them properly and... <sighs> release them, we do the same with dreams. I think it's really important that parents teach their children really early on that nightmares can be good for them and bad dreams can be good if they wake up from them realizing, oh, well, I don't need that much fear anymore. I I release some of it. I feel better now. That's exactly the point, to wake up in the morning and if you remember a bad dream, a nightmare, or even one of those just sort of creepy or haunting kind of dreams, just leaves a negative affect, just Shake it off, pop in the shower, and breathe deeply. And as you exhale, say, boy, am I glad I got rid of that. That was an expression, and now it's no longer inside me. I dreamed it away. Same thing with negative thinking in the waking state. And that brings us to the idea of lucid dreaming. That's our title of this episode this week, Lucid Dreaming All Day and All Night, with a tip of the hat to the kinks all day and all of the night. What is a lucid dream? I wonder if this has ever happened to you. A lucid dream is being aware of the dream you're having while you're asleep as you dream it. Let me say that again. A lucid dream is a dream that happens while you're asleep and unconscious, and yet some part of you is aware of the dream while it happens. And you know you're asleep, but you also know that you're having this dream right now, which gives you volition in the dream. Even though you know it's a dream, you can choose your behavior. So people have had the experience of being aware of having a dream while they're having it. Some people haven't, but many people have. But the next step that you just got into, which is where you realize, okay, I'm watching my dream here. This is a dream. I'm definitely having a dream. The fact that you can realize, now, I'm going to change my dream. I'm going to stop this from happening and make that happen instead. I don't know how many people do that. I think a small percentage of people do that. But people do need to understand that anyone can learn to do that. It's not a difficult thing to learn. It takes practice, as many things do. But, you know, it's your mind, and you can be the director, conductor, or choreographer of what goes on in there, even while you're asleep. Now, when you're totally asleep and there's no consciousness going on, You're dreaming without awareness. But if you have the ability to be aware of the fact that you're in a dream, that spark of consciousness can, in fact, take over the dream. I'll tell you what I did the first time I had a lucid dream. 
And I had not programmed it. I was not attempting it, in other words, or working with the idea. I didn't, I, I, I was not at that point or had not at that point decided to develop this ability. But in the middle of the night, I just very slowly, like somebody turning up the volume very slowly, I became aware of the fact I was having a dream and that I was in the dream and that I am asleep and dreaming now. And wait a minute. How could I be asleep and knowing that I'm having the dream right now? Oh, my God, this is one of those lucid dreams that I read about. Well, logic jumps right in. As soon as there's any kind of consciousness, the reasonable, I'll handle this. Let's, <laughs> let's figure this out. So what it decided to do, my logical, non-dreaming self, the witness of all of this, is you're going to have to prove this to me. So how about if... This is the old pinch me technique. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. I'm from Missouri, you know. Yeah. And so uh, this part of me says something like, um, okay, we're going to count from one to three. And when you reach the number three, Michael, this is me talking to me in my dream right. while I'm asleep. And when you get to the number three, you'll open your eyes wide awake. And if this really works and you suddenly in a moment find yourself wide awake you'll know that you're having a lucid dream right now. Well, the other part of myself said, that's a pretty good idea. Let's do that. So <laughs> one, two, three. Not only did I wake up, I sat bolt upright in bed. And I got out of bed and I started touching things. <laughs> Am I really awake? <laughs> I didn't know what dimension I was in. But I'll always remember it. It was so real. I've had similar experiences since. I practice something called redreaming that we can talk about. If you have a dream you don't like, you can go back and do it over again. And again, as we move into the latter part of this program, I want to emphasize that all these blend together at some point. Lucid dreaming or being aware of the dream you have at night is a wonderful entree to the detached not dissociated, but detached mindfulness of being that clear or that lucid of your daily waking life as a dream. In other words, both are products of your thoughts and feelings. You know, there are people among us here in the, the, the Western Hemisphere that have what I think is a immature understanding of Eastern philosophy, and they will be happy to tell you that life is an illusion or a delusion, and it doesn't matter, therefore it doesn't count, it's all just a dream. Well, philosophically, I think that can be true, however, still be a very important dream, an imperative dream. I mean, maybe life is an illusion. I don't think it's a delusion, but I don't want to get too nitpicky here. The point is, to me, life is a dream. We are making it up. We are responsible. Life is the totality of the choices that we make. Most of our choices are unconscious or semi-conscious, and we are evolving toward making these choices in a more conscious fashion. So I think life is a dream, but increasingly it's a conscious dream. It's a lucid dream. We can make ever better choices, and just because it's a dream doesn't mean that it doesn't matter or it doesn't count. These could be very significant dreams. The meaning and purpose of life could be that it's your dream. And, you know, if, if even if you are looking at it from the point of view of cause and effect or uh, stimulus and response, maybe the stimulus isn't a dream, but certainly your perception of the stimulus is your dream, and the choices you make to respond to the perception in different kinds of ways is your dream before you do it. So if, if you talk about life being stimulus, perception, response, at least two-thirds of the equation is primarily dreaming. So if there's a bottom line, a central theme to what we're discussing, it's personal responsibility, accountability, that there is a give and a take in all things, a yin and a yang, and there is certainly that part of life where we seem to be the target or the effect and life is happening to us. But you've also got to look at the other side of the pendulum, that there is that part of life where we express ourselves, where 
we make decisions, where we create our reality, or at least co-create that reality with the people around us. And having said that, which of the two represents opportunity, right? Are we going to continue to see opportunity as mostly attempts in vain to manage or influence what's being done to us? Or are we going to grow to the point that we recognize the opportunity in initiating responses, as well as being proactive in other areas, initiating out of whole cloth new dreams and goals, desired outcomes, solutions. This idea that life is what you make it, lots of folks say that. I don't think many people believe it. They they just really love being victims and Act as if life is only what's done to you. I got to acknowledge that done to you part, but I don't think it's nearly as significant as what I initiate out of whole cloth or what I initiate as a response to something that's been done to me. You can be a victim of circumstances or you can create new circumstances. And you can look at life as a series of challenges that you can face the same way you faced last time by living on autopilot and just doing what you do. You have the right answer. Why bother to figure out another right answer? Or you can dream up better right answers. And I think that's the real key. I mean, you you don't need to dream up better right answers if you have right answers theoretically. But if you choose to dream up better right answers, you get not only what you need, but also what you want. I mean, the idea is you are good by doing things the way you do things. But in those areas where you have gifts, talents, and abilities and could have greatness, you're not going to get great by just doing it the same way you've been doing it, even if you have the right answer. There could be a better right answer and a far better right answer, and that will only come to you if you dream. If you close your eyes and ask yourself for better right answers and listen, sit receptive and wait for answers and call it introspection, call it reflection, call it meditation, call it prayer. If If you're asking for guidance from a higher power and listening for the answer coming through you, or if you're asking for guidance from your higher self and listening for the answer coming from you, it's the same concept. If, if you want to dream, you can just ask yourself to dream. You can put yourself into a state of mind, a dreaming state of mind, and then purposely launch a dream. And it can go exactly where you want it to go. And if you let go of the attachment to the outcome, you'll have a wonderful journey dreaming how things could be way better than they are. Yeah, good enough is not good enough. I don't know who gets credit for that one. but You do today. Somebody wrote a book recently called Good to Great. I bet you know who that Jim was. Jim Collins. There you go. That's uh, the same theme. Why Settle for Normal is a program Steve and I did a few months ago. Uh, good enough, really? Is that what you want to do with your life? Good enough? I mean, if you're 14 or 15 years old and good enough to just get by, that may sound pretty appealing. But as you move into your 30s and as you begin to create a family or whatever you do with your life, it's your life. There is a good chance it may be the only one you get. I, 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 I don't know. Maybe there are more. But do you want to bank on it? Do you really want to waste this? Especially now with the economic crisis and all the change in the world, people are wondering like never before, what am I here for? if not to earn and spend, produce and consume, buy a lot of stuff and then get frustrated repairing it and replacing it and then running out of space and needing more space and a bigger house for more stuff and never really, you know, being happy, doing the American dream and at times experiencing great joy, but it's inconsistent, something is missing and you just don't know what it is. Maybe it's dreaming big dreams and doing something of significance. And I'll give you a clue, and Steve, you can follow up on this. I think one of the highest purposes of personal development, oddly, is to give it away, to be of service to other people, to develop myself not for what I get directly from that self-development, but what I get indirectly from being of service to other people and just lending a helping hand. Money cannot buy that. And you can say that's a corny saying, that there are some things money can't buy, but I'll eat that corn. I think corny or not, it's true. There are some things money can't buy, 
and they are exalted things. They are, there's a reason money can't buy them. They are eternal things. They are infinite things. They are spiritual things like love and kindness and peace of mind and feeling like you made a difference and just that wonderful peace that goes with having made a little contribution. So if you aren't sure how to dream or what to dream about, here's a simple, simple solution. Dream that you have everything you need, most everything you want, and extra to give away and help other people. And you spend Time and right. money that you can give away and help other people with. Yeah, I think that's very, very good. Let's do an audio journey, and we can install that very Let's thing. Let's do that, indeed. As we think about lucid dreaming, that is aware of the dream, while you're dreaming it, all day and all of the night. So even as you begin a daydream now about being in a quiet and peaceful place... Be aware of the fact that you're doing this daydreaming, and you are now conscious of the fact that you are purposely thinking yourself into and feeling yourself into paradise, the alpha brainwave state, which comes as you close your eyes, and with each breath that you take and release, release the tension, anxiety, confusion, and replace it with perfect peace, with just perfect peace where you feel safe where you feel clear where you feel now and you feel here relax in this paradise place imagine your mind as a projector of light of images of pictures And begin to dream inside your mind's eye as if you're watching these images, image imagination. What images? Well, you can do it essentially one of two ways. You can free associate in this state of gentle relaxation and peace of mind, feeling so safe and so at ease. You can just watch whatever goes by. It may start with routine thoughts of your daily life and affairs, but if you stay with it and refuse to get involved in choosing where to go with these thoughts or being logical or reasonable, but just in a dispassionate and detached way, just let them run, they may go off to less stressful ideas. And you begin to dream of, what you want to do with this next week or two, this year or this decade in your life, this period in your life. You may dream dreams about other people that you love and that you care about, shared dreams. But you know, especially after spending a few minutes in this receptive state, you can use that mind's eye, that projector of images inside your head, to apply your imagination in a conscious direction toward goals and solutions that perhaps you've dreamed of in the past that continue to reoccur. Or maybe you just thought of for the first time today and now you want to explore it. So practice being both receptive in your imagination just watching the thoughts and feelings as pictures and maybe sounds and voices and feelings too just float by, but also knowing you can throw the switch and be the projector. As Steve said, be purposeful in applying your thinking to particular dreams and goals. And the benefit of doing it in paradise is that the mind here is quiet and the heart is calm and undisturbed. So watch yourself as you dream the dreams of what you want the most. And as you're entertaining these thoughts, you're being the perfect host, watching yourself dreaming the dreams of how life could be better, could be great, And you know that doing so is planting the seeds 
so that you have the power to create. Moving toward that outcome, and whether you arrive, doesn't really matter at all. It's that you really, really enjoy the ride and get as far as you can go. So dream big. Make the bullseye the best you can recall or imagine or somehow create. Make the bullseye something way, way better than good. Make the bullseye amazingly great and, and dream big. Dream big and be passionate, clear. Work through the doubt and work through the fear and just take those steps forward. And you can create moving from good and moving toward great. Better right answers that you can create. Someone called these big, hairy, audacious goals. Set the goal, but then go a little farther. Go beyond what you know you could reach, even with difficulty. Stretch your imagination. There's no point in going to the absolutely impossible. Come back a little closer, but beyond what you can easily reach. So that you grow, so that you stretch, just like yoga. As you learn to stretch... You relax, and you become open to the receiving. You may wonder, having been a student of the law of attraction, goal setting, and positive thinking, why it doesn't work better for you. You believe in the principle of setting goals, of dreaming dreams, of investing emotionally in these outcomes, And yet you're wondering, how could I make it better? Look at your willingness to receive. Are you willing to accept all that goes with it? Because our insistence in this series of programs, episode after episode, that the goal is less about a destination than a direction, is part of an understanding that the unfoldment continues, that there is no end to this journey. And if there were, you'd have to start a new journey. So stand open and receptive to all that is entailed, not just this particular outcome, but the process of self-initiated growth and self-realization, the unfoldment of your potential. So with the eye of a dreamer and your heart in the dream, imagining things better than they currently seem, and without any attachment, just a desire to create, moving yourself from here towards something more great, feel confident, powerful, and know that you can. The power in your mind to keep this thing alive, this thing really thriving, this this dream thing, awake or asleep. You are a dream, and other things too, but acknowledge the dream that is part of who you are and what you do. Yes, the stimulus may be real, but how you see it is your choice. You have the option to choose from any different voice. And what you choose to do, well, you have to dream that up first. You can imagine the best, you can imagine the worst, but it's all a dream. And it's your dream to create. So dream yourself out of good and dream yourself into great. In a moment, I'll ask you to open your eyes wide awake with a full memory of this dreaming process of realizing the two-way nature of dreaming and bringing with you gently the dreams you've dreamed and the realization of your identity as the dreamer. Yes, the dream, you are the dream, but moreover, more importantly, you are the dreamer of the dream. Bring that with you gently and effortlessly with a full memory and a profound understanding of what we've done here today. As you take another slow, deep breath, filling your lungs, hold as you peak and as you exhale, 
There. Open your eyes now. Wide awake and alert. Rested and refreshed. Back in the room. Feeling just fine. You know, I'm thinking about uh, a line on Bob Dylan's last album, satirizing the dreaming process, basically. He said, he said uh, what's the use in dreaming? you got better things to do. Dreamings never did work for me. Dreaming never did work for me anyway, even when they do come true. You know, it's like you have the power to create your life, but you also have the power to appreciate it or not appreciate it when you create it. So use the power of dreams to visualize, imagine, sensorily imagine with all five of your senses that you have what you want. And if you don't know how to dream, well, then use this rule of thumb. Imagine that you have everything you need, most everything you want, and more so that you can help others. That's the bestest dream of all. Yeah, I think it's a great cure for depression and sadness, melancholia, too. Go do something for somebody else. And if you find that hard, uh, do it for a little kid, for example. Should be somebody you know, but, uh, you know, I think you can find a way. You know what we're talking about. That's what you have to give. That you can give. It could be time. It could be just interest. It could be listening to somebody. You've always got something to give. And do it and see how you're going to feel. Who knows? Maybe you'll make their dreams come true, too. There you go. Hey, thank you for listening and for telling your friends about this series, Finding Yourself in Paradise, that true, authentic self, the higher self that you find in these relaxed states of guided imagery and visualization, using the mind's eye, daydreaming and night dreaming, but always lucid, mindful dreaming. Share this program with somebody that you know that would love it. Just Log in with your password to FocusedPassion.com, and right under the built-in player, you'll see a big button, Share One with a Friend. Click on that and forward this program or any other program in your collection to your friends. It's free of charge no matter how often you do it, as many times as you'd like. Help other people just as you've helped yourself at Focused Passion. And if you click on that unpurchased podcast button, you'll see our 99 cent store. You know, we've got all these titles, almost 100, I guess, 99 of them, I think. I think <laughs> this is program 99. 99. Right here, yeah. So 99 programs in our 99 cent store for any that we had made before you became a subscriber uh, or any you want to send specifically to some particular person to solve their problem or heal their heart. So again, thanks for listening, and as always, be gentle, love life, and take care of each other. For Steve Snyder, this is Michael Benner. Aloha from Maui.